Uh, okay. So uh, just uh, before going forward, I'm going to just introduce the heart function a little bit more and spe specifically a definition of the heart failure. And that's the reason why we're studying uh, uh, the signaling in the, in the cardiac function because we would like to understand the molecular events underlying the cardiac pathology in order to identify molecules that can be used in a therapeutic application. As you can read here, heart function, as a general definition you can find on the website, is an ability of the heart to keep up with the demands on, on it. And especially failure of the heart to pump blood with normal deficiencies. So whenever the heart has problem in, in pumping the blood to the rest of the body, the whole body uh, fail. And this, as is here, is uh, unable to provide adequate blood flow to other organs such as brain, liver, and kidney, and so on. So if we look at this uh, uh, sketch, we can see normally cardiac function is start with some preliminary uh, uh, problem, preliminary defect with the primary insult, as you see, see, say, see here, and a reduction in the cardiac function. And this can be um, generally, as I like here, with the myocardial abnormalities that can be due for uh, infarction that lead to a loss of cardiomyocytes, cardiomyopathy, but also external workload like hypertension of uh, congenital defects. Anyway, whatever primary insult lead to cardiac uh, function decrease, and this activates several mechanisms, several signals, and then try to compensate the condition in order to restore cardiac function. And this uh, is highlighted here, uh, what intention, I want to focus on this part that's going to be important later on, is the creation of molecules that could be important to uh, communicate the dysfunction in the heart, in the heart, and with the rest of the body in order to activate this function compensating function. As you can see here, initially with the, there's some compensating uh, mechanisms that are able to restore the, the condition of the heart and then function, but if the insult, as you see here, continues, the, the compensating is not effective, we have a maladapting compensation that can get worse and worse and then lead to a, a several abnormalities in the heart, both uh, the energy level and the calcium homeostasis. homeostasis that eventually lead to secondary damage and eventually to heart failure that could be lead to death. And here, as you can see, what happened in the heart is a normal condition, the alternating on diastole and systole, so contracting the relaxation, when there's um, uh, secondary uh, damage to the heart can lead, there are uh, dense function can could lead, could lead to a hypertrophy or dilation of the heart. And then if you look at this histological uh, section of the mouse heart, from the normal condition, we have uh, a complete change on the structural organization of the heart. The, together with the structural um, changes, we have differences in the function of the heart and then lead to the changing. And if we look at uh, detail at the cardiomyocyte cell, so if we go from the heart to the single cell, what is happening is the rod, normal rod shape of the cardiomyocyte when there is this signaling event activated, it can lead to different changes on the cells. There can be complete disorganization of the cells as appear in the apoptosis condition or in the sarcomeric disorganization of changing in the cells to different kind of hypertrophy that could lead to activation of different kind of signaling that if we look at here, is a continuous and dynamic ev uh, event that from the initial um, changes can vary. And here we can see activation and deactivation of kinases that's changing from the acute uh, phases to the chronic can lead to several events. And that's what uh, our interest in the lab is understanding this signaling event changing along the cardiac dysfunction, trying to understand. In particular, I'm going to show today that many of these uh, compensatory mechanisms are uh, are revealed to be related also to changes of small molecules that recently has been discovered that is called microRNA. And as you can see here from this uh, review summary, what has been studied so far, you can see that HARD has been uh, discovered several uh, microRNAs that have been related to different uh, dysfunction or alteration in the function in the heart leading to proliferation, differentiation, cardiac conduction, fibrosis, and so on. 
But just before going on, just a little bit of history, chronological uh, information about the microanalysis, say, it's quite a recent study with the first evidence for being in C. elegant uh, early 90s. And as you can see here, the first uh, discoveries was about in 2005, it's more evident, but so we arrived in 2007, 2006 with more evidence of the role of, car of microarray in cardiovascular disease. Actually, this is one of the first, was our first study on microarray when the application of molecule in vivo in the mouse model was important to uh, changing uh, in acute way the concentration of microRNA in vivo. But anyway, so just recently we can have some evidence this microRNA might be involved for as a therapeutic approach in, in patients for the cure cardiovascular disease. But how does this microRNA uh, work? What is it? So it's a system is really conserved among from mouse to human, and usually start from the, in the nucleus, there is sequences in the chromosome, either intronic or intergenes. They're described um, premier of a precursor molecule of, of microRNA that can be long 1 to 1,000 kb. They are processed by several exonuclease like DROSA, and then export in the cytosol, where again, a process by another exonuclease uh, finally um, obtaining a small uh, short sequence of microRNA around 25, 27 nucleotides. And the single strand mature form is complex with uh, several proteins defining the risk complex. This is the final complex RNA, microRNA protein that finally rec recognizes the target. Targets are my, um, messenger RNA that, that the three prime UTR contain binding sequence for the microRNA. When the microRNA, or at least the complex microRNA protein recognize this uh, messenger, they interfere with, other pro with the protein translation or also with the messenger RNA uh, stability, so lead to degradation. But anyway, no matter what kind of mechanism, the final outcome is the protein is not uh, produced anymore. So we have a down regulation of the protein due to the microRNA. And bioinformatic prediction uh, say that there are several targets for this uh, each microRNA, there can be hundreds of molecules. So if you want, we can compare microRNA to promote through transcription factor that on the gene can recognize different promoter. And this uh, has been revealed that actually this microRNA are really important because it can be associated with different pathology. And especially in the cardiovascular disease has been found that different, the prof expression profile of microRNA is changing upon a cardiovascular disease. As some of them really uh, segregate it changed depending on the kind of uh, uh, cardiovascular disease, can be other infarct or dilation. So this could be a really important uh, tool as a biomarker if you want to monitor the patients or for specifically treat one kind of condition. Another information I want to give you before starting the, uh, our project is about the cardiac homeostasis. As I said before, uh, cardiac function uh, is adjust to initial condition, activating compensatory mechanisms. And some of these mechanisms include bioactive molecules that can be released from the reticulum endoplasmatic ex in the uh, external uh, extracellular level, so in the blood, and play important roles in the maintenance of the heart, as well as the whole organism homeostasis. And basically, this is a regulation of important myocardial processes that are important for the function, then there's hypertrophic growth, Excitation, excitation, contraction, coupling, as well as structural and metabolism remodeling. And this, as I said before, is some process that can be activated both in physiological stimuli or also in pathological stress. And a failure to adequately adjust to this condition eventually leads to cardiac dysfunction. So, with this introduction, our question, initial question was Is there any role of microRNA or any link of microRNA to? to bioactive protein that are actually secreted from the myocardium, so called my myocardial secretome. And also, if there is any uh, protein that is a real target of microRNA, can be this target uh, uh, considered as an indicator of myocardial mere levels and cardiac function. So with this question, we started our uh, project, and we focus especially on this one microRNA that are muscle cardiac specific, as you can see here, is the microRNA uh, bisistronic uh, unit that 
code for uh, Macronet 1 and 123, the thing highlighted here, has been already shown involved in several different uh, functions in the heart. It's just a, it's a brief description, as I say, these two macronates are called from the same uh, uh, bisistronic unit from two different microsomes and are the precursor macronate then process uh, to the mature form either MIR1 or MIR133. As you can see here, MIR1 in specific, that's what I'm going to talk about, has been related to cardiac hypertrophy, cell cycle and development, membrane excitability, apoptosis, and, uh, and that's wrong. Um, just uh, what we were interested in this macaroni is also since our initial study has been published in 2007 in Nature Medicine, we found there was a strong relation, inverse relation of macaroni 1 and 133 to cardiac hypertrophy. And we study, we, we showed this um, both in a, a mouse model and uh, uh, biopsy from patient. That's whenever we have a hypertrophic response in the heart, we have a down regulation of the macaroni. I don't go in detail here in the, in the figure, but this is just northern blood showing that whenever we are pathological hypertrophy or exercise hypertrophy, these are biopsies from rats that have been running, you have a strong decrease of macaroni level compared to the control. And this is the same as you see in the patient uh, having cardiomyopathy compared to control condition. And as I was mentioning before, whenever you induce, uh, introduce a molecule that able to downregulate the macaroni in the in the in the mouse model. This is using antagomir. There are complementary sequence to the to the macaroni. You able to downregulate the the macaroni. And this induces a strong uh, hypertrophic response in the heart. So based on this and the uh, uh, strong relevance that this macaroni can have in the heart. We, as I said before, we started thinking, is there any role of microRNA in controlling protein that actually is secreted? So we started this project. And what we did was culture neonatal mouse cardiomyocytes, infect them with a, vi a viral vector, adenoviral vector in this case, overexpressing microRNA, and then take the supernet for these cells and subject this supernet to proteomic analysis. And we compare, we did a differential analysis comparing the outcome from cells, supernatum from cells that were either infected by adenovirus expressing macronate 1 or a control adenovirus. And among the proteins that were differentially expressed, we were search for the proteins that were predicted to be a target of macronate 1. And one of the proteins we got interest in was actually this fatty acid binding protein 3. There is, it took our interest because this fatty acid binding protein print is a heart specific. So, of course, it would interest in our field. And it's a 50 kilodalton protein that belongs to a multi gene family. As you can see here, there's many different uh, genes produced by different chromo chromosome location. And they're specific to different uh, compartments, like in the liver, intestine, adipocyte, and so on. And, um, this protein is really uh, produced in a large amount in the heart is present in around 4 or 5% of the whole cytosolic uh, pro uh, product pool. It's a bone in tissue which active fatty, fatty acid metabolism. And this is true for the heart where 60-70% of energy comes from the beta oxidization of the fatty acid. And as it bit here, this fatty acid, this, uh, fatty acid binding protein is a lead chevron. It's able to bind to the fatty acid and in the cells bring into different uh, compartments in the mitochondria, for example, for the bed oxidization, but also for other compartments for storage of, uh, of uh, other activity. And our interest was also that there were evidence out in the clinical field where FABB3 protein has been identified as an early biomarker cardiac injury, specifically to the infarct. As you can see here, compared to the uh, biomarker normally used in the clinic, that is troponin, uh, FABP3 is acti actively released from the cardiac myocyte in the bloodstream and can be detected really in advance. This is the, the red line compared to the troponin or the biomarker in time. So whenever you have an um, event of infarct in time zero, the FABP3 is early, early detected compared to other one, and this is a, a really important if you want to uh, 
uh, check on patients. But also the, there is a strong relation of the level of FIBP, this is H5BP in human, H5BP3 in a mouse, the level of FIBP3 really correlate with the size of the infarct. So this is really important. And if you compare with the other biomarkers, troponin T, there is this uh, correlation is not present. And another information that I want to give you about this protein that could be important for the uh, function, the cardiomyocytes, is that w there's been a study back in the 90s that were introducing recombinant uh, FIBP3 in the culture containing cardiomyocytes, you have hypertrophic response of the cardiomyocytes. And the reason I'm telling you this because it's not so much known about this protein, but there are few evidence showing that it's quite important. And actually, when we infect uh, cardiomyocytes with adenovirus overexpressing MIL1, you have inhibition of the protein synthesis, that means inhibition of hypertrophic response that being correlated with this. Um, with this effect of FIBP3. So that's for this several reasons we start pursuing this interest on this protein and we start first uh, checking whether this is a real target. And as you can see here, if you look at the 3' UTR of the protein, we found a binding site for microRNA. And when we did the luciferous assay to validate whether this is a real target that is cloning the 3' UTR downstream of luciferous and then infecting, transfecting the cells with increasing dose of uh, microRNA1, in this case is the, the usual virus over expensive mil one we have a decrease in the activity of luciferase. There is uh, inhibit when we introduce mutagenesis in this binding site. So this demonstrates that the, that the target is a real target mil one On top of this, to be more sure there actually is a real target, what we did was immunoprecipitation precipitation of the of the target, what we do was using a, a oligo, synthetic oligo biotinylated introduced in the uh, lysate from the heart homogenate, did a pull down and then did a PCR specific for FABP3. As you can see here, we got a ban only when we did the immunoprecipitation for the oligo MIR1 as well as in the input, but not in a negative control. So there was another confirmation said that there's a real target. And of course, we perform a uh, Western blot on the protein. As you can see, uh, when we introduce adenovirus or SV1, we have a reduction of the FABP3 protein level. And also, together with in vitro analysis, we did some in vivo to see whether this is an effect called, you can see also in the mouse model. And we took advantage of a transgenic mouse we have in the lab that we generated that is inducible and cardiac specific transgenic mouse over expressing the microRNA1 in the, on the heart, so a cardiac specific level. And this is based on the doxycycline system where we clone um, our mirror uh, coding sequence downstream on the TET operon that is recognized by the TET activator that is produced by the second uh, line. And this is inducible because the TET activator binds to the operon only when you introduce doxycycline in the medium or in the food in the mice. So when the doxycycline binds to the activator, this change conformation recognizes the TET operon and then the active, uh, transcription of the microRNA starts. And this, and you can say here, this is a, a control of microRNA1 in from tissue on these mice, where there's no doxycycline, we have uh, uh, this level that in strongly increase whenever we introduce doxycycline in the food of these mice, we have a five-fold increase in the production of MIR1. And if we check the protein level, the target, we see that whenever we introduce doxycycline, it leads to increase the microRNA1, we are down regulation of the protein. So as you say, in the clinical, they say there, there is a relation with infarct that there is down regulation, uh, increase, sorry, increase of the FABP3. So we uh, took the same model in the lab, we produce, we generate infarct in the mouse, and we tried to see whether there was a relation with the level of microRNA1 and the protein. So after doing the infraction at this level, we checked the uh, MIR1 level of different area, the infract zone, the border, and the remote zone. As you can see here, in the infract area, there is an increase in the microRNA1 level and not in the other. And when we check the FABP3 protein, the serum, there is the gray bar, you can see that the increase the MIR1 level in the, uh, in the uh, tissue and the MIR1 stay high 
after 24 or 72 hours after the, the ligation the caused the infraction, you can see that the protein for the initial levels are down regulated. And there is the similar uh, um, level you can see here when we do in silo in the tissue, checking the mere one level and increase three hours for infection and effect on the on the fiber B3 tissue, there is a strong decrease, even if later is upregulated. And this is uh, some evidence <coughs> we found also in the literature in patients, or at least there was the not real patient, but there's biopsy that been done from uh, people that died from in infarct. And doing staining of fiber B3 from the tissue, you can see here that the intensity of the signal of the tissue, the loss depends from the timing on the infarct. And this actually relates to what we've seen before in the, in the mouse, that early uh, there's a strong uh, loss of, uh, of uh, FIBP3 in the tissue around the two, three hours after the event of infarct, it corresponds to what we've seen before in the mouse, that where the microRNA is upregulated. We did also a similar study in the uh, pressure overload system that is caused by, in the mouse, we did a, a transverse aortic constriction here in the aortic, so this caused a pressure overload in the heart. And as also demonstrated in the past, this caused, for example, seven days after uh, the attack, this trans aortic constriction, a strong down regulation of the macrony. Again, looking at the FABP3 level in the serum, there was, again, a um, an increase of the circulating level of the 5BP3 that correspond to down regulation of the microRNA1 in the biopsies. And this, I mean, this evidence are quite uh, important as we, as you said, our initial aim was considering finding some biomarker of protein in our target of microRNA. But the important thing is uh, this microRNA1 belong to a loop that's very really important is controlled by molecule like insulin IGF-1. And this is a really important uh, uh, growth hormone. It's secreted in the bloodstream and has an important role in cardiac function because it increases the function of the calcium homeostasis, the calcium hell in the heart. And it's one of the mo molecules that is overexpressed when you guys uh, do exercise. So athletes and um, in general has hypertrophic, physiological hypertrophy in the heart, they've overexpressed in IGF-1. A thing that you don't have if you have a cardiomyopathy, where the uh, expression level is downregulated, you have other cytokines or hormone upregulated, like angiotensin and endothelium. What we published a couple of years ago was this molecule is actually uh, belong to a feed lab loop where IGF-1 through AKT and FOXO control the expression level of MIR-1, and MIR-1 per se control uh, IGF-1 and its receptor because both of them are target of the MIR-1, so this is a feedback loop. And since then, we started uh, performing experiments, see whether FABP3 entered the same feedback loop, it could be important. So we, what we did was going back to the in vitro analysis, we isolate neonatal cardiomyocytes mice, and we start measuring the, the concentration of the FABP3 level, both at the cellular level and the extracellular level, so in the supernatant, in the control condition or adding microRNA1, uh, we have a, a reduction of the 5B3 protein at cellular level, next to cellular level, as expected. But when we introduce IGF1, they're supposed to negatively uh, repress the transcription of microRNA, we actually obtain a strong increase in 5B3. So it's a, as a expect, expected, what we um, previously demonstrated, Whenever you act on this IGF-1 uh, pathway that inhibit uh, MIR-1, you have increase in the 5B3 protein. And this is really important. Why? Because, as I say, the IGF-1 together with growth hormone plays a really important role in the maintenance of normal cardiac function and structure in human. And uh, just a general information, this uh, production of growth hormone and eventually IGF-1 start from the brain, from the pituitary gland, and through activation of different organs, produce protein that circulate in the bloodstream and eventually uh, target different uh, uh, tissue and have uh, an effect of, as you see here, a myocardial tissue growth, anabolic effect, increased lipolysis and protein synthesis. And whenever there is alteration of this axis, uh, there is an association of disorder seen also at cardiovascular level. So this evidence, we 
Um, oh, that's what uh, I was telling you before. This IGF-1 is a molecule that's produced, especially when you have uh, uh, doing a, uh, exercise, so when you have to add all the physiological signaling, it's really active, while other molecules like angiotensin 2, endothelin, are not produced. And based on this information, we uh, were able to uh, uh, analyze uh, uh, samples that are from uh, patients that are this uh, disorder on this axis. One of these uh, kind of um, a disease is, uh, came from uh, patients having acromegalic, um, uh, acromegaly, basically it's a uh, gigantism. So these patients have a, an adenoma, the pituitary gland, they produce overproduce growth hormone, they lead overproduction IGF-1. So they have a, around three to tenfold higher concentration of IGF-1 circulating in the bloodstream and then produce several different problems gigantism, but also at the heart, you, have, you might have congesting heart failure that could lead to dilated cardiac myopathy. And we saw before in this condition, in this patient exactly, when we managed to uh, uh, analyze biopsies from this sample, we found that overexpression, over um, uh, concentration of IGF-1 in the bloodstream lead to a down-regulation of MIR-1 in biopsies. So we found this inverse relation I showed you before. So this is a really good model, if you want to call it this way, the patient to study whether the MIR-1 can affect the 5BP3 problem. Here's the, uh, the, the graph, the bar showing that in patients we have down-regulation the MIR-1 level. Con an opposite to this, we also there is also another pathology that, it, if you want, is the other side of the coin. It's a condition when there is that deficiency in the growth hormone. So this means also a um, successful um, reduction of the IGF-1 in the circulation. And this patient uh, show ventricular dysfunction, anomaly in the structure and function, like low cardiac output and induce less ventricular mass. So from this patient, we uh, we were able to obtain serum of patients before and after medical treatment. They usually tend to, of course, treat the condition and manage to decrease the level of the IGF-1, as you can see here. This is the normal concentration of a healthy uh, individual. Acromegalic patients have large increase of IGF-1, circulating IGF-1, then close to go back to normal after medical treatment. And the growth hormone deficient patients has really low concentration IGF-1 compared to the control condition, and after treatment goes up. As you can see here, it was expecting, or what we would like to expect, is that when you check the 5BP3 protein level in the serum, you have the acromegalic patient where the IGF-1 is really high, and so MIR-1 is supposed to be down. We have a strong increase in the 5BP3 protein, and in patients that have been treated that uh, decrease the IGF-1 in the, in the serum, so the micronate is supposed to be up, we have a reduction in the 5B3 protein. And the opposite direction has been found in the patient with growth hormone, growth hormone deficiency. And one thing is more interesting, what we found that this level, this protein, strongly related with the left ventricle mass index. This is a measure of the mass of the left ventricle measured by the echo echographic analysis. So you can see so whenever the protein increase in the serum, you have an increase in the heart and the um, mass in the left ventricle. As you can see, it's something that's really important as if you want to use this protein as a biomarker. As a third condition, we managed to analyze a few samples from patients that have been treated underwent of a growth hormone replacement. And if you look at this table without looking at everything just here, if you look at the IGF-1 level, in patients with cardiomyopathy uh, that have this amount of circulating IGF-1 in the bloodstream, after treatment for several times, this is six months, with growth hormone, they can have an increase in the circulating level of IGF-1. So when we check uh, the FABIP3 level in this, in this patient, you can see that some of the patients, I mean, the number is really low, but you can see the same patient have an increase in the 5B3 protein, and this is especially in the patient that respond better to the treatment. So again, we found this strong relation in the, in the level. But, I mean, if you want to 
find a protein that is a biomarker or a, of a metabolic state and the MIR1 in the level, we want to know that the biomarker is, uh, is real, not only in the uh, pathological condition, but uh, actually in something is more physiological. So we, uh, we did some analysis also in a condition that more, let's say, physiological in dietary restriction on starvation. And um, we, we went there because, of course, in that condition, the, there is a, a strong change of myocardial fa fatty acid uptake in the, in the, where is it here? This is affected during the diet. And during diet restriction, this, the pathway, the IGF-1 pathway is affected, it's down-regulated and there's an increase in the FOXO activity that is the regulator, the transcription factor, they activate the MIR-1. So if you look again in the feedback loop we saw before, while IGF-1 activation through AKT inhibit FOXO3 inhibit MIR-1 transcription fasting, uh, act on FOXO3 through activation of MIR-1. So we mean, did the, the, the analysis of mice, if we can see here, Wild type mice are subject to restriction. There is a strong increase of micronel one level in the biopsies, and that corresponds to a strong decrease of uh, FABP3 at the circulating level. We did the same analysis also in the transgenic mice of expressing micronel one, but since this condition, the micronel was already up. Fasting these mice didn't lead to a, uh, a big difference. It didn't result of course, in big change in some of the two conditions of IBP3 in the serum, but still, of course, as expected, the level is lower compared to the wild type condition. But trying to find some kind of mechanism and see whether the uh, single event controlled by GF1 is uh, again uh, real and true in this system, we subject the mice, we monitor the level again of IBP3 and MIR1 in mice normal condition after fasting, as we say increase the MIR-1 level and decrease of IBP-3. And then this condition of, of fasting, we inject IGF-1 intraperitoneal of these mice to see whether IGF-1 can lead to repression of macronate one well level and then increase of the protein the sequence. And that's what we obtain. After inject injection IGF-1 in these mice, we have a decrease in the expression level of the macronate one in the myocardium that correspond to an increase in the protein level in the bloodstream of the FABP3. And as I say, trying to summarize, this uh, energetic, uh, this protein is um, controlling the fatty acid uptake and, done, and then the metabolism and then the energetic condition is one feature that is really important to the cardiac function because as summarized here, the dysfunction in the heart from normal condition is not only related to the <coughs> change in the sarcomeric structure or protein controlling calcium handling, but also the energy metabolism is really important. And the switch from fatty acid to glucose or back to fatty acid or the increase in the amount of fatty acid uptake could lead to lipotoxic effect can lead to eventually to heart failure. So try to summarize of what I show you today is that we found that microRNA directly regulates cellular as well as extracellular level of this fatty acid binding protein. And this is controlled nicely by the IGF-1 signaling pathway that through modulation of microRNA-1 regulate the level of FABP3 in the serum. And this has been found with a strong relation in, a, in mouse model of cardiac pathology, but especially in dietary restriction, but especially we found also in different conditions of mouse, um, or human patients where the uh, defect in the IGF-1 pathway. And so the, the whole thing comes that identifying a protein, a secreted protein in the serum, like FABP3, could be a really important bio, direct biomarker of cardiac injury, and especially can be an indirect uh, uh, biomarker of microRNA-1 in a cellular metabolic state, as depicted in this cartoon. We can just monitoring uh, uh, the blood for patients and measuring this protein, you can have different indirect information that indirect on the metabolic state and the uh, MIR-1 level in the different condition. And as I just last uh, uh, slide, uh, the most important, if you want, this is the people in Malawi that participate to the study and make uh, the studies possible. And these are all the collaborators 
Gianluigi, of course, and the people that al allow to give us uh, uh, access to biopsies and uh, uh, serum from patients. Antonio Cittadini from Naples is uh, performing a growth hormone treatment in cardiomyopathy patients. Anna Maria Colau gave us the acromegalic uh, patients and the growth hormone deficient patients. While Maori uh, is a, has a facility of proteomic at, a, at the Institute we are. And these are the funding that supported the, the study. Thank you.